Hello and welcome to Nature Live Online. Alison, I'm your host for today. Now, hopefully some of you have been following our previous Nature Live talks, but if you are new to Nature Live, we're an event that usually happens at the Natural History Museum in London, where we give you a chance to meet and speak with some of our scientific staff to find out a little bit more about our collections, but also about the research and the work that goes on behind the scenes at the museum. Now, our doors are closed, but our work still continues. And while we can't safely be in the museum, we are bringing our science and our scientists direct from our homes to yours. And what's brilliant about these talks is that they are live. So this is your opportunity to ask questions. So please, please don't be shy. If you have a question at any point, put it in the comments and we'll do our very best to answer as many of your questions as we can. I know we tend to get a lot through, but we'll do our very, very best. Now today, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Lorna Steele, and we're going to be talking about crocodiles, both living and extinct. A very fascinating, very exciting topic. So let's meet our speaker today. Lorna, are you there? Hiya, I'm here. All right. Hi, it's great to see you, Lorna. <laughs> great to see you, Alison. Now, um, let's start by finding out what you do at the museum. Well, I'm now a member of Task Force, which is an elite group of specialists that can be deployed. <laughs> they're watching. <laughs> um, <laughs> that can be deployed anywhere around the Earth Sciences collections to take on special collections projects. Um, my part in the team is databasing. Um, I'm also calling upon my knowledge of museum collections, in particular the NHM, where I've worked since 2006. But also I specialise in fossil reptiles. While I was still working on site, I was curator of the fossil crocodilomorphs, which is why we're going to talk about fossil crocodilomorphs or fossil crocs today. Here I am, um, amazingly, it was 10 years ago at the Royal Veterinary College, helping with a dissection of a West African dwarf crocodile. Um, I was enjoying myself, I could see I'm smiling, <laughs> but the smell was quite overpowering. Um, so I was quite glad to get back from there and get back to my fossil crocodiles because they don't smell at all. Absolutely, much e easier dealing with those those fossils than the, or the living ones. I don't know oh, yeah. that. <laughs> now, Lorna, what exactly is a crocodilomorph? Well, a crocodilomorph is a group of reptiles which includes today's familiar faces, but also a, a huge host of fossil forms as well. So what we're looking at here is starting from the left, um, the Indian gharial uh, in the middle, the American alligator to represent the alligators and caimans, and over on the right hand side, a Nile crocodile to represent the true crocodiles, which are living on the planet today. But there's another group which has proved a bit of a, an issue as to does it sit in um, the gharials or the crocodiles or is it its own group? And that's the false gharial, which we have a couple of pictures of. Um, scientists cannot yet quite agree on whether it belongs within the crocodile group or the gavials, or is it out there on its own. Um, the bone research and the genetic research sort of contradict one another. So the jury's out on that one, but we've got around about 25 living species in those four groups living today. Wow, that is more than I thought. Um, well, a lot of them are not very famous, you see. Everyone's heard mm. of salties and alligators, but people don't always realise there's a Chinese alligator and there's a lot more caimans than you'd think as well. So there we go. There's a lot of them, about 25. Wow. And whereabouts in the world do we tend to find them? Because they're, they're cold-blooded, aren't they? That's right, yes. Uh, they are what we used to call cold-blooded, as, as are all reptiles, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So in simple terms, they don't heat their own bodies by their own metabolic methods. So they use behavioural methods to heat their bodies. So they either move into a warmer place or move into a cooler place. Because of that, they can't cope with things like snow and, you know, you'll, you'll never get them up here in Wales. So um, <laughs> they live in the tropics, so not near the equator, on the equator, or not very far away from the equator. So you see uh, living crocodilomorphs today confined to Africa, the warm parts of South America and Central America, the southern, very southern part of the states where you, you get the American alligator and the American crocodile, and then over there in Southeast Asia and the northern coast of Australia. So basically they're tropical, they're confined to warm places. Mm -hmm. 
And do they tend to stay uh, put more or less or can they travel about quite, quite worldly? They can travel about. There have been cases of, uh, for instance, the saltwater crocodile, famously large one, um, found off the coast of Australia sometimes. Um, it will, if relocated a long distance because it's deemed to be a problem animal or, or aggressive or a threat to humans, they will relocate back to their own home territory, even if it involves a trek of many tens or hundreds of miles. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> incredible what they can manage. Yeah. Um, they spend a, a lot of time in water, don't they? So how are their bodies adapted to that environment? That's it. They're aquatic ambush predators, basically. They will come out on the land. They will um, move across the land. They will lay their eggs on the land. But they spend most of their time in the water. And that's where they catch their prey, basically, at the water's edge. So they've got a streamlined body. Um, the limbs are held back against the body when they swim. And most of the propulsion comes from the tail, which is flattened from side to side. And so forms a sort of a fin. The tail's also really, really muscular. And you'll see footage on YouTube and elsewhere of crocodiles propelling themselves vertically out of the water like this, using their tail in order to um, grab their prey. They're really incredible. Their eyes um, and nostrils, they're on top of their head, aren't they? Is that an adaptation to their lifestyle? Yeah, that's an adaptation to being an aquatic stealth predator. Um, the animal will lie submerged, not completely invisible, of course, but fairly inconspicuous and keep very, very still still able to breathe because the nostril is on the tip of the snout and the eyes are above water level as well on the top of the head. So it's absolutely brilliant. And that's a fairly conservative body plan that you see in crocodiles, alligators, caimans, um, the gharial and the false gharial. That's just their lifestyle. They're quite fixed to that sort of lifestyle. Here's an alligator, I think, um, you can barely see it. It's got the element of surprise, you see. That's how they catch the prey. Absolutely, they are fantastic predators, aren't they? Do yes. they smell underwater? Is their eyesight good underwater? Yes, it is good underwater, but they, they don't just rely on their eyesight, they rely on smell and sound as well. Um, but the eyes have got a membrane that flicks across. It's called the third eyelid or the nictitating membrane, and this will flick across the eye when it goes underwater, partly to protect it, but also partly to, I think, to change... Um, the wavelength of the light that comes through it. Perhaps it's a focusing device, perhaps a little bit like our specs. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They've got this incredible skin as well, don't they? That, that sort of mm -hmm. tough armor-plated skin. Is that for protection? Oh, it's very, very tough. Um, it took us a, a, at least half an hour during that uh, dissection earlier that to, uh, to get through the skin. Um, the skin has got plates of bone underneath it called osteoderms, and these pretty much cover the back, the back of the neck. They're also on the belly. It is variable between species. Some are more heavily, ar are heavily armoured than others. Um, but it's not just about armour. It's actually also involved in the support of the body. It's got all sorts of connective tissue underneath it, um, connecting it to the backbone. So it, there's more to it than just protective armour. Oh, that is incredible. Um, we, uh, we've got a question. We've got lots of questions coming in uh, from our viewers. We've got um, a question from uh, Finn, aged 11, on Facebook, asking, what do crocodiles eat? <laughs> what do crocodiles eat? <laughs> Anything they want? <laughs> what do they not eat? <laughs> um, Baby crocodiles, of course, have to have small items, so they'll have small fish, crustaceans, insects, and all that sort of thing, stuff that they can manage to catch and manage to eat. Um, prey goes up in size as the animal increases in size. Um, famously, they are predators of mostly mammals that come to the edge of the water to drink, so, uh, or, anim or animals that are crossing rivers, animals that are coming to the, to the water's edge for any kind of reason. But of course, fish is mostly what most of them eat. We've got some images actually, I think, that show what an American alligator is capable of eating. Yeah, some, uh, some pretty tough uh, things are okay. A pretty tough yeah. prey item here. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> soft on the inside, crunchy on the outside. Um, it's a <laughs> and we've also got a picture here of, of a crocodile that's just got a water bird. So anything is, is uh, on the menu really. But what about the um, the gharials? They've got those really thin, sort of almost delicate snouts. Yes, Just very delicate. What, what they can eat? 
It, it does. They're very specialised. They're um, and their specialisation is is probably contributing to their uh, imminent extinction. Um, they specialise in catching fish. That snout can be moved through the water very quickly because it's very streamlined, very narrow. Um, but it's also delicate and a, and a bit breakable. So they'll grab fish. They'll, they're very very good at grabbing fish, um, but they won't cope with anything massive. You know. Um, they can have a small monkey, um, maybe birds, but they, they are no threat to humans at all. They are uh, incredible looking. Those teeth, are, they look perfect for catching fish, don't they? They're very sharp. They're slender, sharp, long and pointed. Yeah. Uh, we had a great question from Simon on YouTube on the subject of uh, crocodiles as predators. Do, do crocodiles themselves have any natural predators or are they, they pretty safe? Crocodiles have natural predators when they're small crocodiles, when they're babies. And because it takes them many years to reach a decent size, there's for those many years, they are vulnerable. So hatchling crocodiles and alligators could be easily eaten by birds, for example, um, or many other predators. Um, but the, the, the man with the huge gun is the biggest threat to, uh, to crocodiles, really, when they reach adult size. Other than that, naturally, not a great deal. Yeah, very few things are going to uh, tackle an, an adult full size crocodile. <laughs> you have to be pretty bad. Once they've reached a certain size, they're pretty safe and they will continue to uh, reach a, a ripe old age, hopefully. We've got a, a lovely question on Facebook from Natasha, age 12, asking Do crocodiles have baby teeth and adult teeth? Oh, that's a really good question. A really good question. The, answer, the, the simple answer is. No, they don't. Um, what people may have heard of, though, is the egg tooth, which is not a tooth at all. It's a little piece of um, hard tissue on the tip of the snout, and, and that helps the animal to cut its way out of the egg as it's hatching. Um, the funny thing is with crocodiles, they don't have baby teeth and adult teeth like, like us, like most mammals. Um, they have teeth which are all the same, basically, throughout their life, and they're replaced very quickly new tooth grows from underneath and pushes the old tooth out of the way and the teeth don't really have proper roots in the way that we know of them there's just sort of hollow in the in the base um, and as the tooth gets damaged from feeding behavior which can be obviously quite violent um, it's replaced by another tooth from underneath it's reckoned that crocodiles if they live a long time will shed thousands of teeth during their lifetime no um we were talking earlier about the the the, the garials, the, the ones with the long uh, thin snouts. Now the males have a really unusual sort of bulbous tip at the end of their their nose, don't they? Which I think we've got a picture of. Why do they have that? What's that for? This is what gives the garial its name. Um, the bulbous structure on the end um, has been likened to a gara or a pot. Um, that's an Indian name for a pot, and um, this structure gives the knows a sort of a resonating chamber on the end. So when the male calls, and it's only sexually mature males that have this structure, and the females don't have it at all. So when he calls, the, the sound resonates through that structure on the tip of the snout. And I suppose the bigger the structure, um, the deeper the sound, the louder the sound, and the female will find that more attractive. Well, that's that's interesting. We don't. I think we don't tend to associate uh, crocodiles with with making lots of different sounds, but in fact, they they make many more than we realise, don't they? Is that an important way that they communicate? And what other ways do they have to communicate? Yeah, they communicate by all sorts of different sounds. They've got different sounds for different purposes. So um, males will bellow to defend their territory against other males, and they will bellow to attract a mate as well to attract a female. And the babies also call to their mothers and to each other in order to keep the family group united. So if somebody wanders off and gets lost, they can call back to the mother and she'll come and find them and bring them all back together. But they've got other forms of communication as well, which are more and more complex than I think we realised at first. And as we delve into that more and more, we're finding out more about the subtleties of reptile communication. But in the meantime, I think we're going to learn a bit more about some of their sounds that they make. Yes, we've got uh, some clips that we can play. We, let's hear the adult alligator sound first of all, because this is really... <laughs> That's pretty terrifying. 
So what sound is this? Is this a, a mating call? Is it a warning sound? Yeah, it's, it could be a mating call or a or a warning to another male that this is my territory. Get out of my get out of my swamp. Yeah, that that's an adult male alligator um, bellowing. <laughs> it's like a lion roaring, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really does. It is very, very intimidating. Much, much the same purpose. It's intimidation. Mm. It's look at me. Look how big I am. This is my swamp. You shouldn't be here. But the the noise that the juveniles make is is quite different, isn't it? Let's let's listen to that now. Very cute. <laughs> Strange noise, but it, it is it's 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 sort of cute. Uh, it's so it's really cute. Oh. <laughs> well, we know you would love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a baby calling to its mother to uh oh well come and help me basically. Babies will give off an alarm call if they feel threatened or unsafe or if there's something that they don't like the look of. Um, and they call for their mum just to keep in contact so that she can keep them all together. They also call while they're still inside the egg um, to ask wow. the mother to come and help them get out of the egg. And other species that do have parental care and not all of them do. Oh, now you've got some eggs that you can show us, haven't you? On, yes. On the, of, of okay. eggs. Let's take a look. Right. I got these from a friend of mine who runs a crocodile farm. And... Uh, they take the eggs from the nests of the crocodile and rear them in an incubator so that they've got a better uh, hatch rate because if you leave them in the care of the crocodiles, um, they don't always all hatch. So here's um, a Nile crocodile egg, about the same size as a hen's egg that, that you might eat here. Um, but compare that with a very rare occurrence, which is a twin, uh, a twin egg. The larger egg, this one, had two baby crocodiles inside it. Oh, wow. so it's, and then stuck back together. So it's typically just one one baby per egg. Typically one baby per egg, but it's very very rare, I believe, for them to have a twin. Wow, that's amazing! Mm. What a fantastic thing to see. That's brilliant. Do they care for their their young? Are they good parents typically? Parental care is very variable. Um, some species have very good parental care. The mother will stay on the nest or by the nest. She'll guard it help the babies out of the eggs when they're ready to hatch um, and then even spend a few months or a few years with them hanging around her for protection. She doesn't feed them. All baby crocodilians can feed themselves as soon as they've hatched. However, the Tomistoma, the false gharial, that lays its eggs and then just walks away. That's it. Job done. Mm. We've got a, an interesting question. Um, from, oh, let, let me see if I can find it. Yep, yeah, from Alfie asking, can they be cannibalistic? They can, yes. It, I think it's quite unusual for a mother crocodile to eat her own babies, and that's partly the, the reason for the communication and the calling. Um, however, another crocodile could quite easily come along and eat babies from another nest. Yeah, that does happen. Mm -hmm. It's quite common. It's one of the main things that uh, that is a threat to young crocodiles cannibalism and we've got another question from uh teddy uh on facebook he's aged four and he wants to know how old crocodiles can get oh pretty old about the same as a as a human with a a, a healthy long lifespan so 70 80 90 wouldn't be out of the question there was supposedly one in a zoo in Russia that got to 120 something, but I don't know if that's a, a verified report, but certainly um, several decades is not at all out of the question. Most of them are not mm. even sexually mature to at least 15, 20, 30 even. So, you know, they, they're quite a good age and they're still not what you call fully grown. Mm. So do they continue to grow throughout their age? We've got a question from um, Ryan on who's age. Of asking how long, how big can they get, how long can they grow? 
Most of these species have got sort of a, a typical adult size. And I'll just say one thing, the males are usually a lot bigger than the females at maturity, okay? So you see a male adult alligator, he will be much, much bigger than his mate, the female, um, by as much as sort of she'll be two thirds his size, that sort of thing. Um, the largest we get today, one was measured actually only a few years ago, a uh, saltwater crocodile. He was six meters, 19 centimeters um, while he was sedated. Wow. Yeah, and that's, that's a pretty good upper size for the saltwater crocodile, the Nile crocodile, and also the Indian gharial. But mm. the very, very big ones, because obviously they have to be very old to be very big, uh, they, they're getting harder and harder to find. Now, Lorna, we've got lots and lots of questions coming through uh, from our viewers about whether um, crocodiles and dinosaurs are related to one another or whether one is descended from the other, which brings us very nicely onto our, our topic of, of fossil dinosaurs. So, so are they, uh, fossil crocodiles, sorry, so are they related to dinosaurs? And when do the crocodiles first emerge? They're related, yes, that's right, because dinosaurs and crocodiles both belong to a larger group of reptiles way, way back in time called the archosaurs. So they've got the same sort of ancestry, but a long, long way back. Um, and birds are living dinosaurs now. So you can regard crocodiles' nearest living relatives today as birds. That's a very weird oh, thought to take away. That is a really weird, yeah. <laughs> Crocodiles are close, more closely related to birds today than, say, lizards, snakes, and tortoises. Wow. Um, we've got a, a, a question from Amanda asking, how come the crocodiles didn't die out with the dinosaurs? Do well, we yeah, that's a good question, but it's, it's also a bit of a weird one because lots of other groups didn't die out either. So it's like, so if you're going to... Right. Um, wonder why that is the case, then you've got to ask about uh, things like sharks, most fish, um, mammals, everything really. So it's a bit of a, it's just one of those things. I think one of the great things about crocodiles is that they've, they've got a great formula and they haven't changed it. You know, being an ambush predator, um, there's always something to eat. Um, they have a long lifespan, a low metabolic rate. They don't need to eat very often. You know, it's just a recipe for success, I think, really. Mm. Um, now, we know that some ancient crocodiles were much, much bigger than crocodiles today, don't we? How big yes. did these ancient crocs get? Some were easily uh, 10, 11, 12 metres in length. And we've already said that a really big saltwater croc today would be around about six metres. So you're, you're approaching double the length, really. Um, the coloured outlines that we've got there with a human down at the bottom for scale are several fossil forms. The one at the top, Dinosuchus, is a, actually a fossil alligatoroid from the USA. Porosaurus is a fossil caiman. But there are actually giants in all of the groups, the alligators, the caimans, the gavials, the false gavials and the crocodiles. So there are giant fossils in all of those groups. They're incredible sizes, and you often see uh, depictions of, of ancient crocs fighting with dinosaurs. But could that potentially have happened? <laughs> yeah, that's. I know the image that you're talking about. I think that's a, it's Sarcosuchus having a fight mm -hmm. with uh, Spinosaurus, or yeah, yeah, like that's that. the one. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not even absolutely sure. I'm not a dinosaur person that they even lived at exactly the same time and in exactly the same place. But if they did, that is a plaus quite a plausible fight. Makes a good <laughs> doesn't it? It really does. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, when it comes to the, the ancient crocs, were there some that were fully aquatic? They were marine crocodiles? Yeah, there's a really weird group, which is sort of a, a, a side splinter group that, um, that is extinct today, called the Thalatosuchia. And that includes some forms that were coastal, probably spent their time in the coastal waters and came on land to lay their eggs. Um, and another group, here's one of them now, um, from a deposit in Germany. This one's actually hanging on the wall in the Natural History Museum by the stairs as you go through up to the restaurant. Um, but there's another 
group related to these, which were fully, fully aquatic, you know, flippers, tail fin, um, and some of these got to some quite large sizes. They're well represented in the Natural History Museum's collection, bizarrely enough, because there's a lot of them that came out of the clay pits in and around Peterborough. So um, the clay pits are, some of which are still there, but they're now, where they're worked, they're worked by machines, so there's not really much fossil collecting going on there anymore. Um, so we've got a really, really good collection from those sites that came into the museum in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, and people are still working on these fossils, even though they've been sat in the museum for all that time. Which is brilliant. And we're going we're gonna to talk specifically about, um, but about one uh, fossil that you worked on. But I just want to get a question in from um, Zoe uh, while we're on the subject of crocodile swimming. She desperately wants to know how fast crocodiles can swim. Ooh. <laughs> It's a really tricky one, isn't it? <laughs> oh, sorry, Lorna. <laughs> oh, dear. I mean, obviously, we, we've already said again and again, they're ambush predators. So there is yeah. some very, very sudden turn of energy that can be brought into play. But they don't have stamina. You know, this is part of the, the, the downfall of this kind of metabolism. There's no real long-term stamina there, you know. Um, it's a short sprint grab it and if you don't grab it then well you're gonna be a bit hungry for a few more days so good question i think zoe ought to go and find that one out i do have my experts book with me oh. but I feel it's about a thousand pages and i don't think i'll be able to find the answer zoe so um <laughs> oh, sorry. one to investigate though definitely and uh, yeah <laughs> i would imagine some of those marine crocodiles could, could swim fairly fast Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, we've got a, a question um, on YouTube about whether any fossil crocodiles have been found in the UK. They, they have, haven't they? We've got some in our collection. Yeah, it, it's probably one of the best places in the world for this particular group, in all honesty. Um, and this one collection that came from the Peterborough area in just like a couple of decades, um, it fills virtually half of the NHM's fossil croc collection. That's how good it is, that's how good it is. There's some brilliant stuff in there. My favourites. <laughs> yeah, it must be amazing getting to wander around and look inside. And I hear you um, actually named one of these uh, Peterborough teleosaurids. Yeah, one of the teleosaurids uh, needed a new name. There was a PhD student just a, a few years ago, she started. Um, and she was revising the whole group because it got into a, a bit of a taxonomic mess, really, with um, everything that came out of the ground um, had been given the name Steniosaurus. And obviously that's a bit of a mixed bag. And so it needed sorting out. And part of the process is to organise it so that some of these have got new names. So they're no longer associated with the rest of Steniosaurus. And this particular specimen, its skull is over a metre long and there's most of the rest of the skeleton. Um, came out of a clay pit sometime before 1913 because that's when it was named and described. Um, it's not the most attractive specimen. We don't have <laughs> conservation work um, on the skull and, and some of the other bones as well. It needed supporting with it being so massive. It was cracking. Any of these fossils that come out of a clay matrix like the Oxford clay or the Kimmeridge clay, there are always issues with a mineral called pyrite, which mm. expands and shrinks and turns into acid and causes all sorts of mayhem. And um, the museum's got specialist conservators that can work their magic and sort it all out. They're very, very good. So we got this thing all sorted out and had to come up with a new name. And I'd um, been wanting to name something after Lenny, the front man from Motorhead, my musical hero. And I said <laughs> to the other guys, why don't we call this Lemmy Sucus, which means Lemmy's crocodile? And I thought they would all go, who's Lemmy? Or um, don't be stupid. <laughs> and they didn't. They jumped on it. They thought it was great. <laughs> I'm so glad they did. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think Lemmy would have been delighted to be named after, uh, have a crocodile named after him. I know. Sadly, he was dead about 18 months before we got the paper oh, out. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's brilliant it's a brilliant name and uh, it, it really got picked up in the press didn't it at the time yeah it did a bit the, the rock music press sort of picked it up yeah it was really good <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Thanks, Lorna. So I'll just take a before we, we move on. Lots and lots of questions, uh, and I thought this one might come up, about the differences between alligators and crocodiles. How can we tell uh, one from the other? Well, the snout shape is the main difference. Um, they're different groups. They're related to one another, but they their ancestors diverged quite a long time ago, and they've been separate for a long time. But when we look at the snout from above this is where you'll notice the main difference between the two on the left we've got an alligator they've got a much more rounded tip to the snout and the skull is very broad we've got a crocodile on the right and the snout is more pointed and the skull is more narrow um, but there are some subtle differences and some of the crocodiles have got a more wide and rounded snout some of the caimans have got a more pointed snout so it's not always um, 100% rule, but it's a it's a general rule. Yeah, there are other differences too. Um, alligators don't have a functioning salt gland, so they can't go into salt water because they can't remove it from their bodies. There are other very small, subtle differences. We've got um, lots and lots of people asking um, how many teeth crocodiles and alligators typically have. How many, how many teeth? teeth? Oh, how many teeth? Lots and lots. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it varies. Um, the short snouted mm. uh, caimans and alligators and so on have less than a longer snouted crocodile, but the one with the most teeth of all probably is the gavial. I think there's over a hundred in each jaw in the mm. Indian gavial, only because the jaw is so extremely long. Um, I did help a student with some tooth counting work, but it was a few years ago and I've forgotten now. Um, sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, we were counting <laughs> numbers in gavial skulls in the life sciences collections. It was very boring. <laughs> I was going to say, a brilliant job. <laughs> now, um, Lorna, again, sorry, I was watching. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we've got lots of questions um, about whether um, crocodiles are in danger of extinction. So what mm. pressures are crocodiles today facing? Oh, untold pressures, like nothing that's ever gone before, as far as the crocodiles are concerned. Um, we, we know that they've been hunted in the past. We know that um, a lot of the species are protected from hunting now or that there's a quota, a limit on the number that can be killed in the wild. And today there are people farming them in crocodile farms. Uh, they are reasonably easy to look after, I believe, and um, just throw food in now and then and take care of their veterinary needs. Um, and farming is to provide, well, cynically, it's to provide an income for the person that owns a farm, of course, but it's also to help pr protect the wild populations. So by providing the product, and the product is crocodile meat and crocodile skin for the luxury goods market, um, this takes the pressure off wild populations that otherwise would be hunted in the wild. Mm. So anyway, that's one point of view and could possibly be argued against. But the main pressure for all crocodile species today is habitat loss very simple because us humans are altering water courses we're draining swamps we're encroaching into the places where the crocodiles live our towns and settlements are expanding we're cutting down forests and we're completely changing um, the face of the earth and many of these species that we've mentioned are down to very very low numbers in the wild the Chinese alligator you know it's amazing that it's not actually already extinct to be honest the Indian gavial, um, there's a lot of conservation work going on, but it's losing its habitat. That's what's happening everywhere. A lot of them are doing fairly well. You know, the American alligator uh, is still widely hunted and is not held as uh, threatened or uh, endangered in any way. Um, and the saltwater crocodile, I think, has made a bit of a recovery as well since hunting was banned. It's a very variable picture uh, across the group. But there are some real bad cases that are on the edge of extinction right now. Wow. So there are, are there efforts going on? I know uh, you mentioned crocodile farms as being uh, a, a way of, of dealing with the whole trade issue. Um, but are there conservation efforts um, happening? Yes. Out? 
Yes, there are conservation efforts. There are um, work, there's work going on particularly on the Indian gavial where eggs are harvested in the wild, taken away, um, incubated and reared to ensure a good hatch success and then put back in the wild to boost the numbers. But that's no good if there's not much wild space for them to live and if the fishermen keep putting nets across the river and so on and so on. Pollution is another effect. You know, it's it's everything seems to be rather stacked against them. Mm, unfortunately, and a lot of it down to us. Do you think um, attitudes towards things like luxury goods, for example, do you think they're changing? I think, I did think that attitudes towards luxury goods, such as this 1920s handbag, um, were changing. But I went on a well-known auction site the other day and I can see things like this all dyed into very gaudy colours, um, watch straps, handbags, briefcases, belts, all sorts of things, um, all still for sale, all for rather silly money. And I naively thought that this sort of thing is all very out of fashion now. Um, I've just shown you this bag, it's 1920s. I got it from a charity shop and I only use it for outreach work. It's made of alligator hide and it's got a whole baby alligator stuffed and stitched onto the outside of it. And I think the person that bought this in the 1920s didn't use it much either because it's still in very good condition. Yeah, so I look at that and I'm, I'm kind of horrified. So Most I... people are horrified. I think what, what horrifies people from previous experience when I've taken this handbag into the studio in the museum, mm -hmm. people are quite cool with, oh, it's made of alligator skin or crocodile skin. Oh, okay, that's not very nice. But when you see it's got a whole animal stitched onto the outside of it. That yeah. sort of brings it home to people as to what it actually is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. I guess it's like a reaction depending on which side of it people see. Yeah, and I bet that provokes a lot of debate as well, which is, is no bad thing. Well, I mean, I don't use it, blooming neck. I'd be embarrassed. No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, it, what does global um, climate change mean for crocodiles? Bearing in mind that they live in warm places and bearing in mind that a lot of other animals and plants that live in warm places are extending their ranges. So, for instance, mosquitoes are coming further north. You know, we're worried now about the malarial mosquito in the UK and so on. OK, so you'd think they should extend their range now, wouldn't you? Because parts of the world are warming where it wasn't warm enough before for them. Well, they probably will extend their ranges further north and further south. But there isn't necessarily the habitat there for them to move into. So um, global warming ought to be good news for crocodiles in many places. But it might not be good. It, you know, it's going to take more than an increase in global temperatures. For them to be better off absolutely it's so we shall see. Pe people are monitoring this to see what happens very closely yeah it's, it'll be really interesting to see and uh, hopefully because they're such amazing um, creatures hopefully um well we've uh, persuaded a few more people that crocodiles and alligators are absolutely amazing and worthy of our respect and our conservation as well. Um, we've got a few more questions I'm keen to get through before we wrap up. Um, so I'll, I'll just run through some of these. Uh, there's some good ones. Uh, Frankie would like to know which is which is most dangerous out of all the crocodiles, the alligators, the caimans? <laughs> Hard to say, I would imagine. The Nile crocodile and the saltwater crocodile have the reputation of being the most aggressive and of having killed the most people, but that's partly because of the places where they live. So for instance, where the Nile crocodile is in parts of Africa, there are human populations there who rely on the water where the Nile crocodile lives. So the Nile crocodile accounts for a lot of deaths in Africa, put it this way. However, I spoke to the guy who measured the six meter, 19 centimeter salty um, a few years ago and, and sedated him for the purpose of, of measuring him. And he said it's a lot easier to work with the really big crocodiles rather than the smaller ones, because the smaller ones are more agile and more aggressive. The bigger ah. ones are a bit more sluggish, a bit more dozy, and have got that sort of sense of security and confidence that you aren't, you aren't any threat to him. So he said he preferred to work with the really big ones than the smaller ones. Interesting. <laughs> 
<laughs> We've got a lovely question from Ashley. She wants to know why we don't see many crocodiles in English rivers. I'm glad we don't, but. <laughs> Too blooming cold. Too cold, exactly. <laughs> um, unless, of course, people do silly things like flush them down the toilet. Um, uh, one was rescued from a canal in Birmingham a few years ago, wasn't it? Seem to recall. Oh, yes. Um, the guys from Crocodiles of the World near Oxford went and picked it up and rescued it. I'm sure it was in a canal in Birmingham. Someone had released an unwanted pet. It wouldn't have survived very long. No, far too cold. It's far so too cold in Birmingham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they like a nice warm climate. <laughs> yeah, not, not too cold. So, no. Um, there, are, there are obviously fossil crocodiles in the rocks here in the UK. Um, Absolutely. They were definitely here in the past, but, mm. but not, not now. <laughs> not now. Um, got a very interesting question on YouTube, um, I think, to the, the climate change issue. Uh, will climate change mess with um, sex determination in baby crocodiles? Oh, yes, it's got to do, hasn't it? Um, yeah. Sex determination in crocodile eggs happens not uh, necessarily by via the chromosomes but by the temperature in the nest um, and whereabouts the egg is in the nest and the general ambient temperatures inside the nest so yeah it's um at a certain temperature you get mostly one sex and either side of that temperature you get a mixture and then when you get further away from that temperature you get the opposite sex i can't remember which way around it goes um so yes, um, that, that could make a, have, have an effect. However, um, when the mother croc maintains the nest, she adjusts it to keep the temperature where she wants it. So she'll put more vegetation on, take it off, put more sand on top, take it off. You know, she will monitor the nest and adjust the temperature accordingly. But yeah, it's a good point, it might have an effect. Yeah, it's so really interesting. I really hope someone is studying that and monitoring it. Yeah. Absolutely, one to keep an eye on. Um, we've got a, a, people asking if it's um, safe to keep crocodiles and alligators as pets. Oh, not really advisable. No, I mean, no. um, uh, a, a friend of mine does. I mean, I'm not saying he's got an alligator in the bath or anything like that. Um, he runs a wildlife park, which used to be open to the public, um, but he got fed up with answering silly questions from the public and people throwing Coke cans at his crocodiles. So he closed it. And now he keeps it just as his own private reptile rescue park. So you can, but you need a lot of space. You need a lot of knowledge. And, uh, you know, the heating bills are just going to be massive, aren't they? Yeah. Just trying, trying to keep um, a huge building full of crocodiles warm in the winter. Mm. Yeah, they're much better off in their, their natural environment, I would say. I think best to leave them in the natural environment or pop along to one of the many really good reptile centres or zoos where you can see them being looked after properly. Absolutely. Um, now, we, we've had quite a few. I'm just trying to scan through uh, to pick some questions. Ah, oh, now we had one earlier um, related to the sounds that uh, the, the, the baby crocodiles make, those calls that we played earlier. Um, and Sophie has asked, do the young have a distinctive call that lets the mum recognise her own babies? Mm -hmm. I suspect they would, to be honest. Yes, and I think, well, we know that this happens in birds, don't we? Mm, exactly. We recognise the call of her own baby chicks. So I think that probably would happen in crocodiles too. We don't know. Uh, again, you know, it, maybe in my enormous book of all you need to know about crocodiles, <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll read of that later. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of great questions um, from YouTube uh, asking, are crocodiles social creatures? Hmm. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're social under certain circumstances and they're not social under other circumstances and it depends on the species as well so um, for example they will come together and tolerate one another's presence if there's for instance uh, a load of fish coming up a river um, then crocodiles that normally would socially distance for want of a better word 
um, will actually tolerate being in close proximity. We did show an image earlier on of crocodiles in a crocodile farm where they're virtually lying on top of one another and then they will tolerate one another's presence quite happily, you know, up to a point. So yeah, um, when they come to, they don't live in family groups, that's the important thing, but um, they will tolerate one another in a reasonable amount of space, put it that way, mm -hmm. until things get a bit tetchy like mating season and then um, males will claim a certain stretch of water as their own and then that's it, it all kicks off. Um, and uh, I think we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, it's, it's probably worth mentioning it again, but Sam age six, asked, what is the rarest crocodile? That would be, at the moment, probably the Chinese alligator, which I, the, the last I heard was down to 200 individuals. Wow. Uh, the Indian gavial is probably not far behind that. That's just, well, if I'm honest, it's probably doomed, but... There we go, we'll, we'll see what happens. A number of species are listed as critically endangered and the Chinese alligator is one of them. Mm. Such a shame, they're just, yeah, they're amazing creatures. Um, one uh, question from Cara, aged 11. Uh, she wants to know if crocodiles mate for life. Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Mm. I'm not sure they do all the time, but they certainly can do. And uh, in captivity, uh, they won't break up uh, a breeding pair. So, for example, at Crocodiles of the World, they've got a pair of American alligators and they have been together for like their whole lives as adults. They're a pair, you know, they won't separate them up. Um, I don't know whether that would happen in the wild. I honestly don't know. Again, consult the big book. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we all need a copy of your, your big book, Lorna. <laughs> we certainly do. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, and, and just lastly, I'll squeeze one more question in before we wrap up. Uh, this one's from Facebook. Um, and again, it's, it's to do with them being uh, cold-blooded. How do they survive living in water when they are cold-blooded? Water tends to be quite cold. Yeah, water does tend to be quite cold. But what they will do is, um, don't forget, in the tropics, the water isn't, as cold as it is here um, yeah. but they will also come out and you see this all the time in, in a lot of reptiles they come yeah. out and warm themselves up in the sun so perhaps overnight the nighttime temperature has dropped and the body has gone a bit chilly but they will drag themselves into the sun and warm themselves up if they then get too hot they will slide back into the water but don't forget that in the tropics shallow water is still going to be perhaps not quite bath water temperature for us, but still comfortable enough for a reptile to keep its body temperature stable. Um, some of them can tolerate a little bit of coldness, like the American alligator. Um, if it stays really, really cold for a long time, they will die, but they can tolerate a bit of cold for a little while. But that does restrict their range. Because mm -hmm. we do see images sometimes of them, uh, of uh, alligator or crocodiles with in frozen lakes with just a little snout uh, sort of poking out but that's only temporary temporary that's condition probably, yeah temporary and that's probably mostly alligators that that have got that sort of thing going on but uh, oh that would be extreme obviously they can survive that sort of thing for a short while but long term um, they're not going to survive because at some point they need to come out to the sunshine and warm up well Lorna we are pretty much out of time I think I'm afraid it's such a shame it's been brilliant talking to you today it's, I've, found, I've learned so much about uh, crocodiles and alligators it's been fantastic thank you so much uh, for joining us and for answering all of our viewer questions as well you know, um, I've learned how much I don't know <laughs> <laughs> well done everyone for all the good questions I have to read my book properly again <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to tell me that you'll have to uh, get, uh, tell me where i can get a copy of that book because it, oh. it's it's amazing <laughs> online purchasing site <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Lorna. hopefully you'll come and talk to us again but we'll say goodbye to you for now bye for now then bye and thank you to you, our viewers, for all of your fantastic questions. You you foxed Lorna there a few times, which is great. Um, now, 
If you want to join us again, we're going to be here um, on Friday at 10.30. We've got a fantastic talk about killer whales. Um, and we are, of course, streaming every Tuesday and every Friday. It's Tuesdays at 12 and Fridays at 10.30 a.m. And if you want to catch up on some of our previous talks, uh, you can do on our um, NHM YouTube channel. So if you've, you've not seen some of our previous talks on sharks and dinosaurs and all sorts, you can check those out as well. Thank you again. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of your questions. There were so many coming through, but hopefully we answered um, many of them for you. For now, I will say goodbye, but I hope to see you again. Take care. Thank you.